In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Emmeringen Foundation, Dewey and LaBeouf, the estate of Richard W. Wyland, Arcus Foundation, Gill Foundation, and these funders. And by the annual support of In the Life members like you. There are an estimated 1.6 to 2.8 million homeless youth in the United States. Up to 40% identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. November is Homeless Awareness Month, and In the Life examines the plight of LGBT youth experiencing homelessness. We begin with the launch of New York's first permanent affordable housing units to be offered to LGBT at-risk youth, followed by a stark look at youth kicked out of their homes. What services are offered to them on the street? How do they cope and survive? And a look at new research concerning family intervention. We brought everybody together. And up! There's nothing for you to hide. Make a promise. On September 9, 2011, the True Colors residence was officially recognized as New York City's first affordable housing for LGBT homeless youth. Back in May of 2007, West End had a fundraiser, and we honored Cindy Lauper. Cindy said to me, you know, you do such good work at West End. Is there anything that you could do for this population? And I said, you know, I just came back from the pier. I saw kids that were homeless. It's too bad you don't have a place like this for homeless LGBT youth. I realized that, yes, there was something we could do uh, if we could get people to buy into it, and that it should not be a shelter, that we really wanted something that was a long-term solution. Individuals here will have their own apartments, they will have rent-stabilized leases, and they will pay rent. I gotta say, I've never in a credit committee call before used the words LGBT, I've never used the name Cindy Lauper. I believe that a strong society is an inclusive society. And if we want to win big in this world, we better include everybody, because we need everybody to win. Offering a total of 30 units, residents moved into their first permanent homes on September 1st. My name is Angela Lewis. I'm 23 years old, and I currently live in True Colors Residences. You know, before you start a transition, you're not fully aware of, oh my God, well, I want to go outside look dressed as a transgender female. My mother raised me as a single parent. I was actually 17 at the time. She said, I love you dearly, but you can't live in this house no more, and I'll give you $1,000 for your rent a room, but I just can't raise a child that's gay. My name is Marquise D. Perkins. I am from Buffalo, New York, eight hours away. This is my little studio apartment. Came with, you know, the refrigerator and the freezer. What brought me to the city is that, um, like, my mom had drug problems, but it's nothing new all her life, you know, back and forth. You know, so when she does have a relapse, I always like pick up the slack. And I guess I just got tired when she lost the apartment and then I was gonna live with my grandmother. But my aunties and uncles kind of have a problem with me being gay. So I didn't want to put that pressure on my grandmother either. I'm excited. My first apartment, you know, so I think I almost cried <laughs> when I got it. It was cool. I stuck out the shelter because if I would've went back, I probably would've just been a failure. And I, I guess my, I was gonna prove to them, like, I can make it here, even if I am gay. You don't throw your kid away, but sometimes people, because of the religious dogmas that they believe, they feel that their dogma is more important than their children. My best friend at um, grammar school moved, well, actually ran away to New York when he was 17. And he'd been through the um, Ali Forney shelter and got an apartment. I let him know that I was coming. He said, I can stay with him. 
from 12 to 6, I have to leave at night. So I kind of ride the trains all night and then I'll go back in the day and just kind of sleep all day. I used to live in Covenant House and I used to get up from 41st and 10th and travel to Canarsie, Brooklyn and went to South Shore High School, which is one of the most bad, like, you know, worst high schools in Brooklyn. Being homeless is hard. When it's cold and you really have nowhere to go, that's what hurts the most. There's days where, you know, this building was open yesterday. Damn, it's locked today. What the hell am I gonna do? The shelter is only is uh, it's only for 30 to 60 days. You was lucky to get the 60 days if they see that you're trying to find a job or trying to continue education. This is permanent housing. Um, it's not shelter. The criteria for entering is pretty simple. You have to have a history of homelessness. You have to be homeless at the time. You have to be 18 to 24 years old, and you have to identify as LGBT. The leases are Section 8 leases, so that anyone who moves in here, their income has to be under 50% of the area median income. What this project does is it takes a proven affordable housing finance model, applies it to the needs of LGBT youth who otherwise are at risk of having to leave foster care without support, are at risk of being on the street. So we recognize that this project, I think, more than ever is truly life-changing for the residents who are gonna move in here, and we're just proud to have played a role. A lot of our residents were homeless. They lived from shelter to shelter, so we're trying to give them some permanence here, showing them that, um, you know, financial workshops, educational workshops, job readiness workshops. Um, I'm doing one-on-one -on -one counseling on relationships, and, you know, just giving everyone basic skills that'll last you through your whole lifetime. We use what's called the harm reduction model, helping them get the education that they want to get, helping them get established in the careers they want to be in, helping them learn how to pay their bills. I have like a little list right here of like all my bills and rent just to start off because I have to have money issues. So it's just like, this is all the stuff I pay already. So if I have to really figure out all of this. And these are the things that hopefully you would learn from your parents, but because that relationship was is so damaged, they're not getting it from that source, so we have to be that for them. When you look at Angela and Teddy, they really are the survivors. When I first came in here, Cam brought me upstairs. She said, are you ready? I said, yeah, I'm ready. These kids, this is their first apartment, and they're beautiful kids. I currently work for Partners in Care as a home health aide. This is my home health aid certificate, um, right here. Certificate of completion, Angela Lewis, core training as of July 28th, 2011. Currently, I am a beauty advisor for Dwayne Reed. And it's so comfortable now. After the first couple of days of really adjusting to it, it's just like, uh, I love it. I love it. It was Cindy's deep connection to her friend Gregory Natal that inspired her to record the song True Colors. I just, I, you know, I cried. I saw the little cornerstone for Gregory. My friend Gregory, he was um, one of my best friends when I was in my early 20s before I became famous. You with the sad eyes Don't be discouraged Oh, I realize It's hard to take courage my name is Carl Eagleson. Gregory was my lover. For six years, his mother kicked him out when he was 12 or 13 because he was gay. He was dying of AIDS in 85. We just shot the she video. He's in it, we call. The disease got worse and worse. And as he was in the hospital, he said, well, you know, that's what Friends of Four came out. And he said, could you write a song like that for me? And I was like, yeah, I will. But in the meantime, a song was sent to me, and it was for Ann Murray, and it was kind of a country gospel song. But I see your true colors 
shining through. I see your true color. 1997, I was on email. Every other letter was from somebody in the community who felt depressed about the fact that they were gay, was going to kill themselves, and then they heard true colors and they felt better. True colors are beautiful like a rainbow. Thank you. Peace. Gregory got his wish. I did sing a song for him that became popular and helped the community. LGBT youth are kicked out of their homes by their families at alarming rates. Up to 40% of homeless youth identify as LGBT and one in four LGBT teens are kicked out after coming out. The LGBT community has historically and continually systematically ignored queer youth homelessness. You know, it's not as sexy as marriage equality. It doesn't have good sound bites like don't ask, don't tell. It's not been an issue that has risen to the level of other things that we see as important. My mother and I had a really complicated relationship. She's an alcoholic, has a lot of her own issues. So growing up was kind of this constant battle of trying to understand what was going on for her. That really only compounded further once, once I came out. The violence intensified pretty quickly. I mean, within a couple of months, I was out of the house. I knew that if I left, that she would hunt me down and bring me back and that I I wouldn't have a chance to run ever again. And so I waited until I had enough bruises that I thought they would do something. Uh, and I went um, to the sheriff's station in my county. And she was arrested that night. I was too old, really, for them to think I should be put in the foster care system. It was too much work to have me emancipated. It was much easier just to sort of let me go and assume that, you know, I was an honor roll student, I'd somehow be okay. That was the first time that I felt completely alone. I had no idea where I was going to go. I had no idea where I was going to sleep, how I was going to get to school the next day. And it was, I was pretty profoundly lost. LGBTQ youth homelessness really happens in every community. And yet, this is something that so few people are talking about. Away from the media spotlight, organizations like the Knight Ministry provide food, necessities, and overnight emergency shelter. If a youth is on the streets, and especially if because they're GLBT or questioning, it uh, has a whole other dynamic uh, to their experience of homelessness. We have a philosophy of meeting people where they're at. We're learning their names. We get to know people, build trust over time, and hear from them what they want to work on. We actually need these programs, so these are places for us to go. For some people, if they can't get into the crib, for them to go shower or for them to eat. I'm thankful to live another day. I'm thankful to see everybody once again. I'm thankful for working with the crib. I'm thankful for having another day on this earth. Thank you for my brother, see him for another day. I just want to see everybody in my family. Again, I am grateful and always thankful for the crib being open, of course, for all of us who are a family because we all stick together. We all try and take care of one another as best we can. There are absolutely horrendous instances when kids come out and are immediately kicked out of the homes. And at other times, parents are trying to mold their child back into this image that they had of who they were going to be or what they were going to look like. And in doing that, are inherently rejecting who their child is. My father was very abusive, he was an alcoholic. Him telling me, you ain't gonna ever be a homosexual, I'm gonna break your neck if you turn out to be this, that, and other. It scared me, so I started running away. 
I went back home one day and he just beat me up. He really beat me up bad. My lip was busted, my eye was black, everything. I knew at 16, that's, it was over for staying with him. I told him to his face, I hated him. I didn't want to be like him. I didn't want to be around him. The message I have to those parents that don't know what to do is to sit back and actually ask your child, is it that they're actually going through? Take the time out and actually sit back and talk with them and try to get an understanding. Once youth have entered the system, organizations like Green Chimneys offer supportive housing, basic life skills, and career training. When youth come to Green Chimneys, they tend to have been somewhat stabilized. And by that, what I mean is that we typically, since we don't run a shelter and we run a transitional living program, that we don't usually take youth you know, coming right from the street. My experience has been very um, enlightening. I was couch hopping, no job, no income, um, completely depressed, not knowing where I was gonna be tomorrow. My biggest goal was a stable home, like some place to actually call home that was consistent. I'm Puerto Rican and Dominican, so in the Latino culture, it's a very big taboo. Various people in my family just don't understand that love isn't supposed to have a gender, they don't really get that. My mom, she believes she provided a stable home for me when really she didn't. She loves me regardless, but she just, she thinks it's a phase. She's just very judgmental. This is my room, nothing fancy. Um, there's a bunch of graffiti that um, people who used to live here um, did. Um, it's really weird and ugly. I hated it when I first came. I just like, I, I want to say that I wanted to go home, but I had no home to go back to. Hey, Tiff, how are you? Hi. How was your day? I uh, had an interview, the job searching, all that good stuff. Okay. I've definitely built my own little family and support system here. When they get on me, it's about getting my life together and keeping me on track. It's not about who I am. Yeah. They just want to make me a better like person. <laughs> Hopefully in 15 months when I'm out of Green Chimneys, I'm independent enough financially, emotionally, physically, legally, all that good stuff um, to live on my own. <laughs> you know, when we have a 20 year old who's getting ready to move out and go into their own place and we think about, okay, they know how to cook a meal, um, they know how to pay their bills, um, they got a job. But, you know, when their birthday comes up, who do they spend it with? You know, when they need something in the middle of the night, who do they call? Um, and so maybe some of those answers aren't a biological family, and that's absolutely fine as well. But who is that? It's great that it's the program that they're with for a little while, but it's not going to be in five years or ten years. How are we building that piece for them in their lives, I think, is a big key. My mom, I'm back in contact with her. We're back and forth. We've developed a better relationship now that I'm in the system. We see each other every few weeks. I keep it very short, a couple hour visits, just to keep us from fighting. A sad reality is just like, parents don't change. Like you will never change a parent's mind. What I've noticed in the homeless youth field, at least, is that for a long time we've been very youth empowerment focused. But what we've tended to ignore a little bit is uh, the family piece of that. And if we as providers keep ignoring a potential support network for young people, that we're really doing a disservice to young people in the long run. We may be helping them in the short run, um, but we're really not setting them up to have a stable future. And our newest addition is the Family Therapy Intervention Pilot, which we'll be working with LGBT youth and their families. This year, New York City awarded a grant to Green Chimneys to start a pilot program to reunite homeless LGBT youth with their biological families. This grant is one of the first of its kind in the nation. The model for their program is based on research by the Family Acceptance Project. Well, we're actually developing very specific interventions. We start by having the family talk about their experiences and what that's like for them. Of course, we learn more about their faith tradition and cultural background before we work with them. And we help them make the connections between behaviors that they're using to try to respond to their child and what actually is happening in the life of that child. 
The Family Acceptance Project is conducting much needed research on the harmful effects of family rejection. The Family Acceptance Project has allowed us to talk to families and parents and say, look, we can prove to you with this data that if you're doing these five things to your child, isolating them, not letting them go to LGBT events, telling them that you're ashamed or embarrassed about them, or even just being silent about their identity, you are putting your child at really high risk. There's very few dollars that are actually allocated towards family preservation. Most of our emphasis has been on removing a child from a home. But the reality is that I also don't want them to stay in my residential facility until they age out. I want every young person to be, a, be in a home. Um, I want them to have a dog, I want them to have parents, I want that. And, and there's, there is something that is very different about that than a residential facility. That's just the reality. There are definitely instances where there is no alternative but to remove that young person from their home. That said, we have simply assumed as though it's inevitable that families will continue to reject and abuse their LGBT children. There are no communities that we should give up on in terms of working with them to increase understanding and support. We actually interviewed what happens in families when they end up out of home and saw families that were really devastated by something that they didn't understand. Their child ended up out of the house, maybe they threw them out. Very rarely did a parent ever want that to happen. Very rarely would they ever want to be separated for the, forever from their child. So we can change that by early intervention and by reunification programs. I really didn't want my parents to know at all. And I'm sure they suspected something, but I never wanted to admit it to them because I was afraid of getting kicked out or afraid of losing my family. I had expressed my um, concerns that he could be gay and what that meant where I grew up, uh, macho, Hispanic. Being gay was a weakness as far as the way I was raised. He had some feminine qualities and I thought that I could change it. I remember looking at EJ with uh, disappointment and even maybe with disgust. He was young, but I know he felt it. At that such a young age, there was already a gap starting to form between us in our relationship. One night when he drank too much, and that was really, really scary for both of us, but when we went online and started looking at all the statistics about drugs and suicide, that was the turning point. We knew that what we were doing wasn't enough and that we had to do more. I saw an article about Family Acceptance Project and the importance of supportive families, and it was like a lightning bolt. It, it's kind of hard for me to, to think back when I was 14, 15, 16, and how things used to be. Now it's like completely 100% turned around. Everybody can change. Anybody that is out there that has any kind of heart, can we can change their mind. We have a wonderful relationship and our son is gay. So what? It's wonderful, you know? And I want that for everybody. There are enormous policy implications of this work. One of the things that I had an opportunity to do was to talk with Senator Kerry's staff about our findings. Madam President, I've listened to my... They then included a provision in their recent bill in early 2011, Senator John Kerry from Massachusetts introduced the Reconnecting Youth to Prevent Homelessness Act. This is the first Senate bill ever to directly address LGBT youth homelessness. It focuses on helping youth reconnect with their families and escape life on the streets. John Kerry's act, I think, is another sign that people are paying attention to the fact that providing shelter and immediate service needs obviously addresses the need that's happening currently. But if we'd like to reduce it in the future, we have to do more than that. Politicians talk so much about education and up in the economy and how do you expect to do that if you have thousands of homeless kids who have the potential to actually be someone? One of the first things that needs to happen is that we need to start talking about it. And then putting our resources and our energy with the organizations that are doing great work, donating to them, volunteer at your local queer youth center, youth shelter. 
across the country, there aren't enough services, just on a really basic level. Any homeless youth, they're your brothers and your sisters. I mean, my God, this is a part of our community, and these are people who are struggling. Just because it hasn't been your experience doesn't mean that it doesn't exist and you can't respond to it in some way. The thing that helped me cope most was really starting to realize that there was a community out there, that even if I couldn't access it, even if it was nowhere near you know, the county that I was living, was this idea that there were other people and that someday I could maybe get there, you know, if I was lucky enough to escape. I promised myself that if I made it, that I was going to make a book so that no other queer kid would feel as alone as I felt in that moment. And uh, here it is, this is kicked out. My life is gonna be in a better place when I leave here. I'm gonna be almost done with a bachelor's degree. I can be in a position of leadership and power to really help someone out and be able to look back and say, I went through that. So yeah, I get you, like I went through that. The youth that see themselves going out, just understand that you need something in this life to look forward to. Find that one thing that's gonna keep you on a straight path and don't let, don't let anything, nothing, you know, steer you away. Thank you for watching In The Life. To watch historical coverage from the last 20 years of In The Life, visit our website at itlmedia.org. See your true colors shining through. I see your true colors and that's why I love you. So don't be afraid to let them show your true colors. Your true colors are beautiful like a rainbow. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Emmering and Foundation, Dewey and LaBeouf, the Estate of Richard W. Wyland, Arcus Foundation, Gill Foundation, and these funders. And by the annual support of In The Life members like you.